Haiti is the Palestine of the Caribbean. Who controls the water in Port-au-Prince? Who controls the water in Gaza? Behind me, without being intrusive, we've got permission from the community in Solino. We see dozens and dozens of families gathered trying to get drinking water, trying to get clean water to bathe. Who controls the sewerage system in, in, in the trash? How many children come of age with this reality right here? This could be Gaza, but it's Port-au-Prince. Who controls the electricity in the internet in Port-au-Prince, a city of 2.5 million with hundreds of thousands of people on the run who are internal refugees. Sound familiar? Gaza, 2.3 million people. They say now officially over 25,000 dead. We could perhaps double or triple that statistic given the extreme hunger, the dehydration, uh, all of the children under the rubble. And right beyond these walls here, we have the rubble of Port-au-Prince. We have the rubble of how many homes? Tens of thousands of homes and what were stable working class communities burnt to a crisp by the government gangs, the Michel Martelly, the PHTK, the Ariel Henri death squads and paramilitary squads who have displaced hundreds of thousands of Haitians. And that's why we can say that Palestine is the Haiti of the Middle East. All right, everyone. So today is a very special uh, interview because we're having join our show today. Uh, first time on air after uh, coming back from Haiti uh, 48 hours later. Uh, Professor Danny Shaw, for those you don't know, Professor Danny Shaw is someone who has expertise and has studied uh, in the uh, Latin and, uh, and Caribbean studies, race, ethnicity class uh, as well. So joining us now, uh, Professor for our viewers and subscribers, can you introduce yourself? Tell us about your work and moreover, um, what you have been doing in Haiti in regards to bringing awareness of the overall humanitarian crisis that is impacting that nation and its people and our overall, I guess, the U.S. involvement in that country as well. Greetings, Kit. Thank you for the uh, invite. I've been traveling to Haiti, learning from the Haitian people, studying Haitian Creole since 1998. I was an educator in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I was studying uh, Spanish there as well, working with the different anti-imperialist forces in DR in 1997 through 2001, uh, living a lot more in the Caribbean than here in New York City. And that's when I first got deep into the uh, Haitian liberation movement, learning from the Haitian uh, leadership. And of course, the way that Haitian migrant workers live in the Dominican Republic is a whole nother uh, huge topic. And I would say that in my 26 years of following Haiti very closely, I've never seen such a dire humanitarian moment <clears throat> as we're seeing right now. And that includes the 2010 uh, earthquake. Certainly the displacement there uh, was massive, but the displacement now as well is, is, is ongoing. Right now there's an estimated uh, half a million residents of Port-au-Prince who've been burned uh, out of their homes by these marauding death squads. They call them gangs in the U.S. media, but I am making the argument that the word gangs is grossly insufficient to describe what these paramilitaries are doing to the civilian population of Port-au-Prince. Well, so I think it would be difficult to do in such a short amount of time to talk about the decades, dare I say it's centuries of what has happened to Haiti and its overall turbulent political past, its, its, its history, and overall the scars that many of the people for generations have had to deal with. Because right now we're in 2024, the presidential election cycle, we have potential wars and new wars arising up and people may not be fully aware of overall how Haiti got here. So for my viewing audience, can you please educate us in regards towards how this all started? How did this crisis just happen? Because it just didn't happen overnight because we, we all remember in the 2010 when, in, when the earthquake impacted Haiti, we are, we're well aware of the failure of the humanitarian relief efforts, but there was a time even before 2010, this is all a gradual process 
how did this happen? What what is our I guess our government's involvement in the economic and political instability? And overall, what what is being done to really help the people of Haiti eventually get back on their feet? Because this seems to be an ongoing crisis of president. Then then there's a coup. A new president comes in. There's more instability. How did this all start? The number one myth that the mainstream media pushes is that Haiti is this uh, poor country. We can't hear any report without the cliche, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And what the Haitian people are teaching us for so long is that we are not the poorest country. We're the most misunderstood country. We're the most exploited country. We're the most oppressed country. Uh, U.S. governance, Republican, Democrat, has long seen Haiti as their backyard, uh, as a neo-colony where all big financial decisions, diplomatic decisions, political decisions, military decisions, paramilitary decisions go through Washington, go through Paris, go through Miami, go through Ottawa. Uh, in Haiti, they call it the core group, these foreign uh, neo-colonial powers like the U.S., Canada, France and England, uh, this, these are the core group countries who have, at least since 2004, uh, made all the big dis decisions about Haiti, including the 2004 to 2017 UN uh, destabilization mission in Haiti. Uh, at one point, you had 40,000 US and UN troops in 2010, right after the earthquake occupying Haiti. So there's a plethora of books, of, of documentaries that your audience, that everyday people should check out. Many of them are, are behind me. This book just dropped yesterday. I'm mm -hmm. super excited to, uh, to, to have gotten it so quick. Uh, Jake Johnston, an incredible researcher out of D.C., he says Haiti is not a failed state, uh, but it's a successful model of neocolonialism. The way the Haitians often frame it is that colonialism has two hands and one is to take the gold mines and the, the stevia plantations and the iradium is one of the biggest minerals. They're called in Spanish tierras raras, these rare precious minerals that you can find in Haiti that are very tough to find. So that's the usurping hand of the colonial state. And with the other hand, what they do, and this is what Jake's uh, title speaks to, Elite Panic, Disaster Capitalism, and the Battle to Control Haiti, they give these crumbs, these NGO crumbs, these charity crumbs. I mean, proportionately, if you look at Haiti, I don't know if there's another country in the world uh, similar that, that, that proportionally has such a high rate of NGOs and in, in, in missionaries, but mm -hmm. we've seen that that's done very little to actually alter the course of, of, of Haiti's destiny. And what the Haitians always say, the quote I've probably most heard since the 2021 rebellion is um I see and you say you say grand moon tet new yo we mm -hmm. Haitians are adults don't treat us like children we don't need need your colonial paternalism your colonial disdain just let us be but unfortunately in Haiti kit nothing happens under the nose of the US embassy the US intelligence committee President Biden, the UN mission, which continues there, it's called the Bini in Haitian uh, uh, Creole. So that's a bit of an overview mm -hmm. that Haiti's curse is much more of a global or colonial curse than anything else. So obviously, right off the bat, I, before we even talked on this, sh before the show went live, you talked about how you have been censored on Twitter and how obviously, you know, we here at Hard Lens Media, we know all too well about the Jack Buddha censorship, as do our colleagues in independent media. Um, but when you're trying to bring this up on independent media or social media, or even if you're given the opportunity or chance to, to be on the mainstream media, overall, when your message is out there, uh, what has it been like for you as a professor, as someone who has been on the ground to see things firsthand, knowing that your words are being censored and that there is attempts to keep you silent or either that not only keep you silent, making sure you can't inform people about overall what, what is happening there? Because in this day and age where we have information at our fingertips, 
we're noticing, and I'm beginning to note and beginning to notice. The crew. Let me apologies for that stutter there, but uh, we have seen firsthand just overall how easy it is to put the sensor or silence button on, and then your voice, no matter how loud it is, is silenced. What are some of the situations you have to deal with in regards to dealing with censorship and suppression, or is it that people telling you that you can't speak? Yeah, that's an important question. I think the consolidation of this global regime of fascism where somebody can uh, hit a hit a button and decide, well, this person's voice, we're going to silence and marginalize and shadow ban and delist. And the censorship is real. It's McCarthyism 2.0. The censorship from Haiti, uh, most of the Haitian people, there's a population of over 12 million in Haiti. Most Haitians don't have access to internet or Wi-Fi or even electricity or running water. Um, more than 50% of the population is not food secure. So the censorship starts there just very, very concretely. The Haitian people don't have a voice. It's the only, well, you have Martinique and Dominica uh, mm -hmm. in Guadeloupe who also speak uh, Creole. But in general, in the Americas, Haiti also suffers a certain uh, isolation. It doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese or, or English, though Haitians are a very polyglot uh, people in general. So I've been trying to get the word out and translate the Haitian leadership and their messaging, their anti-imperialist, anti-colonial messaging. And as of um, mid-October, I could still reach hundreds of thousands, even millions of people on Twitter. And then with the shadow banning and the delisting, forget about it. I'm down to reaching 100 here, 1,000 there. I mean, it's, it's, it's pathetic. And how do we get these voices out? So we're looking for solidarity. We're looking for support. Hashtag uh, Molegaf. Um, Molegaf is one of the grassroots organizations organizing in the ghettos of Port-au-Prince. These are the ghettos. This is really the main story. Um, the ghettos of Port-au-Prince, when I say ghettos, the oppressed communities, Bel Air, Fort Nacional, Solino, these are communities of hundreds of thousands of millions. This is the lifeblood of the capital city of Haiti, of Port-au-Prince, a city of 2.5 million, where more than one-fifth of the population has been displaced in the last year to three years. Uh, about half a million Haitian families have been displaced. Who's going to give a voice to these refugees? There's an internal refugee crisis. So there's a corrupt government. It's called the PHTK. That would translate as the all Haitian bald headed party, an extremely <laughs> strange uh, name for a political party. I've, I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> all Haitian bald headed party and no affiliation. Anyone out there trying to okay. you know, make no my bald jokes. I had to, you know, I had to preemptively get ahead of that one. No, um, th this party is extremely corrupt. They were benighted by Hillary Clinton, who flies down in dramatic Hollywood fashion in 2010. The elites are bickering about who's going to be the next president and prime minister. And the Clintons fly down and Hillary Clinton says, uh, Michelle Martelly, this extremely corrupt neo-colonial stooge. And Michelle Martelly oversees what the Haitians call the gangsterization of Haiti. So over a half a million um, guns, U.S. guns, 100 percent U.S. guns. There's some Israeli galils, according to my research as well, in that mix. But it's the U.S. guns that fuel these paramilitary death squads who have descended upon these peaceful communities. Mm -hmm. There's a slogan that the uh, twice couped Haitian president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, uh, used. He said, our goal is to go from misery to dignified poverty. By no means a radical demand. I mean, what could be more human rightsy and humanitarian from misery, from abject misery in which most of the Haitian people live to dignified poverty. That's why he is again uh, kidnapped. Jean Bertrand Aristide. I have a ton of books I can recommend. Read The Uses of Haiti by, by the now uh, rest in peace Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Farmer. But this is the international context that's now consolidated in one of the biggest refugee crises that I've ever seen or, 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 or covered. And AP and Reuters might have this or that line about the refugees, but they have absolutely no historical or sociological explanation. So that's the informational blockade that we're trying to challenge and beat, uh, you know, with our 
with the Haitian people, you know, as 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 voices of the Haitian people translating uh, so much important stuff that they need to educate us on. So uh, while we still have time, we still got plenty of time here. Uh, you recently came back from Haiti 48 hours uh, later, and we're grateful that you've been on that you're coming on to our show, educating us about this overall humanitarian crisis and history of Haiti. And obviously, I want to make sure we can have you back on because I don't think 30 or 40 minutes is going to do any justification whatsoever. And I encourage everyone to please follow uh professor shaw on his social media so just real quick before i ask you my next question here is his twitter account danny shaw they thank you for following us professor danny shaw please follow him on social media and then of course this is his linkedin where you could find him on tiktok youtube um you know threads instagram twitter all that as well as information about him as well so please everyone if you haven't done so already check it out i will be posting these links when i clip this interview on it for our youtube and rumble page uh but you were recently in Haiti, and can you at least inform us what you saw on the ground there in regards towards interviewing the people, the political and economic situation? Um, and since you've you've been there, and since you've you've done research, and you've been part of the overall story of the history of Haiti, um, what has changed? What has uh, improved? What is the feeling of the people on the ground there? Uh, what 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 have you seen firsthand? so that our audience, especially those tuning in right now, can get a better understanding of Haiti. Because, again, so many other things are becoming front and center issue for this year of 2024. And I think a lot of us forget that there is a humanitarian crisis right at our doorstep. And that's why I did that Gaza, you know, Port-au-Prince video. And to have to compare any area of the world to Gaza uh, demonstrates the absolute intensity of the situation on the ground there. Yeah, Kit, at a personal level, I can't believe it's surreal that 48 hours ago, I was still in Port-au-Prince with my mm -hmm. close friends and family and comrades. And um, now I'm back in 30 degree New York City teaching <laughs> college students. <laughs> I mean, in Haiti, like the deforestation dating back to the uh, French pillage, it's got to be one of the most humid hot uh, places in, in the world. So you have this 100 degree, 80 percent humidity sun beating down on you. And uh, the roads haven't been kept up or ever built in many areas as part of this exploitation. So you just have this dust, this dust that rises up. And there's a real crisis of, of, of water across the country. It's extremely um, expensive for Haitians to try to access drinking water and, and water to bathe and clean and wash clothes. Uh, right now, gasoline is $13 US dollars per oh. gallon. $13 Ooh. per gallon. So for example, in Port-au-Prince or anywhere in the country, if you, I knew that one would get your attention kit, give you a second to take a deep breath. Well, look, I'm from Chicago. Things are already expensive as it is. And you're from New York city. So you already know, but $13, this whole city. And I know New York city would riot, but God almighty $13. Oh my God. So you have families and kids who at night are on the prowl and they'll go and suck out the gas from any car that's sitting there because they can flip that for like what would be almost, you know, a week's fortune if they don't get caught and get murdered and get killed by the, you know, by the Haitian state, the Haitian state is non-existent unless it has to do with harassing uh, poor people. It's these uh, gunmen um, armed with the heaviest automatic U.S. weapons. These are the notorious warlords. You know, I don't want to get into the Hollywood imagery, the sensationalist imagery that came out of Afghanistan with warlords, dare I say, Charles Taylor and Liberia and Sierra Leone in the 90s, but we do have these marauding um, warlords. Uh, the U.S. has barely given it any any coverage, and they, uh, you know, I was I was there in Port-au-Prince and I was on the rooftops, and you can't be exposed in any way because the gunfire is nonstop. Every yeah. it's very difficult to do any live footage or uh, because uh, we couldn't we couldn't get a link back to the US or France or wherever for the interview. So you just have bullets whizzing by you and you have these death squads trying to invade uh Solino S O L I N O because these these neighborhoods are not well known in the United States, but Solino, a community of over a hundred thousand people. So they have to erect their own barricades. 
they're doing everything they can to defend their own community against uh, gangs. I, I disagree. I, I put the word gangs in uh, quotation marks. I don't think gangs is uh, sociologically or historically sufficient in any way to describe what the 2.5 million people, 500 uh, uh, thousand refugees at this point and counting, they're not up against gangs. They're up against PHTK. That's the government fueled and funded death squads. They want to take out these different neighborhoods because these were the neighborhoods that have resisted colonialism, resisted the dictatorship. So in 2021, you had this massive upsurge. You had the, 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 the rebellion in Haiti. And I was there from February 7th on February 7th is Constitution Day in Haiti. So next week, it's going to be very interesting because you have this unelected uh, prime minister named Ariel Henry, who a uh, State Department tweet decided would be the president, the prime minister after um, Jovenel Moise was assassinated on July 7th, 2021. I was somehow on the, you know, the last plane uh, uh, out of the country there uh, in when, when the president was assassinated. But that prime minister, Jovenel Moise, he wasn't loved by the people. He was seen as a petty uh, tyrant, but no one wanted to murder him. The movement mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, a, a movement in the streets wants to take you out of power. It doesn't necessarily want to destroy you physically, though many may express that. So the Haitian people didn't want to murder him, but that was done by Colombian paramilitaries to cite Jake Johnston's work again at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He wrote an amazing study of how those events of July 6th and 7th in 2021 played out with this Colombian paramilitaries, 18 of them working with U.S. intelligence, uh, Haitian American agents of the DEA and, and the intelligence community assassinated the president. I mean, it's, it really sounds like um, a Hollywood spy movie, but that's exactly mm -hmm. how it uh, happened. So that's some of the objective on the ground reality in, in, in Haiti right now. Um, the country's at a standstill. There's different political factions vying for uh, power. I would say the forces of liberation at this moment are very isolated under the gun. Many leaders have been kidnapping, uh, kidnapped. There is an epidemic of kidnapping uh, across mm -hmm. Port-au-Prince, across the capital city. There's no history of kidnapping unless you talk about the French uh, slave traffickers. But mm -hmm. they've used kidnapping the past few years as a way to intimidate the popular movement. So you have the burning down of entire communities. You have sexual violence weaponized against Haitian women and families. And then you have these, these kidnappings to further intimidate them. So 80% uh, of Port-au-Prince, a city of 2.5 million, roughly the population of the Bronx where I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, uh, it's a city that's been shut down, that's been paralyzed. So that means everyday people can't go to work or try to find work or go out and collect water. Yeah, it's a very dire situation. Um, I, I think I speak on behalf of most of my audience here when we've never really heard of overall this 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 disaster of, of Haiti. So uh, I definitely want to see if I can get you back on the show because uh, 30, 40 minutes is, is not going to do uh, any kind of justification because I have so many other questions to ask. Um, so now that you are back and you're going to be uh, teaching you know, your classes in, in New York City, um, overall, when will be your next um, documentary or, or, or production going back to Haiti? What is what is what are some of your next steps to really bring awareness to this humanitarian disaster that's that's right again in by the United States because you know I, when when I also look at uh, Haiti I know that it's bordering another country the Dominican Republic and it's it's almost I, I don't want to say night and day because then that's using corporate media talk but there's there there's there's an overall difference between one side of the island and the other side of the island the history and the complexities there uh, so. When, when it comes down to your work and your projects that you're going to be doing, what is some of the next step and where can people go to support your work and follow you? Because the story is still ongoing. I mean, just because you left doesn't mean the story in Haiti is over. Yeah, and it's because, because it's so dangerous. It's been tough for other um, researchers and journalists and, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to get in there. It, it, it's to risk your uh, life. I just put some key hashtags there. Molegaf mm -hmm. is the, um, Molegaf is one of the uh, youthful 
grassroots organizations doing the work. They don't want NGOs. They don't want charity. They just want to be left alone so they can do their own work and then save Solino. Solino, kind of the South Bronx of uh, Port-au-Prince. I try to go down to uh, Haiti as much as I can, um, but it's, you know, it's difficult, the funding. And right now it's dangerous. It was not easy to get back uh, to uh, the United States from, from Haiti. So there's no real guarantee. You know, I'll just say to um, to the Haitian community out there, Kembe solide, fuck nullité, nous pas jamais perdre l'espoir. You know, we never lose hope. We have to keep uh, fighting. I think um, a lot of Haitian Americans, just why you, they feel very discouraged because they never hear one positive word in the U.S. media. And that's how the Haitian leadership has always um, uh, trained me that this is first and foremost an informational war. Because when we hear about Haiti, kid, and I'm so thankful for you all uh, doing this show, because all we ever hear about Haiti is diseases and coups and, you know, mm-hmm. horrible negative things and voodoo. But voodoo is just, a, you know, a beautiful religion and way of life. But it, but it's always negative connotations. Um, I lived in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I've been an educator and, and, and worked as an international affairs analyst in the Dominican Republic. Uh, beginning back in 1997, so I told just giving shout outs to my um, my my people because what Haiti really re- needs right now is unity mm-hmm. and, and understanding and patience and education. A lot of Americans kind of throw their hands up, overwhelmed after speaking for 10 minutes, and go, "Okay, okay, okay." So what do you what do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want me to do. If people don't have time to educate themselves, certainly use those hashtags. Like, don't don't give to the Red Cross. Don't because, and that and that's what a lot of this you know book is about, and so many mm-hmm. other books. Uh, the professor from York College, Mark uh, Schuler, uh, disaster capitalism, and so much of those donations, like ninety percent, stay within the NGO, stay within the United Nations, and no Haitians are ever employed. We don't need to employ white people. You know, mm-hmm. foreigners, blum, in Haiti, everything is blum. They, and they don't see many foreigners these days. So I, they, they, you know, when I'm walking by and people don't know me, they just assume I'm some missionary or U.S. soldier. You know, I catch all types <laughs> of stereotypes. That's, that's a conversation for another time. Uh, that's um, why I got to have you back on. That's because because this, 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 this is not going to, this interview is not going to do it. We're only scratching the surface. That's the thing. So, yeah, uh, a, so go ahead. I, mean, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't mean to cut you off. No, Continue no, on. No. Sure. No, I appreciate the back and forth. And, you know, as, as I sit here too, things are just coming into my own mind because, again, it feels mm-hmm. surreal. But I'm, I'm an ethnographer by training. Mm-hmm. I'm an ethno linguist. So what I do is I collect just pages and pages of, of language notes on Haitian mm-hmm. Creole proverbs and, and, mm-hmm. and, and slang. And so that's what I've been doing since 1998 in Haiti. And in 1997 in DR, I have all the ethnographic notes and studies uh, over here in, 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 in my library. So it's, it's, you know, we have to enjoy this work as we, as we do it. And, you know, it's, it's a matter of hours ago that I'm sitting there with all these Haitian leaders, they're fearless and the bullets are just whizzing by us. We had to take refuge behind some type of shed on the third floor. We were doing everything. Uh, this is another thing I can plug every Thursday night. We teach anti-imperialist courses with Midwestern Marx Institute. Mm-hmm. If, you, if people haven't checked out the Institute, um, please, please do. Uh, every Thursday at 8 p.m., we have open popular education classes on different anti-imperialist struggles from Palestine to Haiti to what's going on in the Middle East uh, right now with quite a bit of united resistance to U.S. occupation of, of the Middle East and their using Israel as a battling ram for their colonial design since 1948. So there's a lot of ways for people to um, to plug in. There's so many internationalist uh, connections. The Haitians feel that their future is with the people of the United States, not the Bidens and the Trumps and the Bush, Bushes and the Obamas, not the State Department, not the CIA. The, and, and the Haitians often say that their future is going to go through Havana and their future is going to go through Uh, Lima, Peru, and Santiago de Chile in the sense that they want a true international community. 
because we always hear, Kit, the international community. How yeah. is it that Washington, D.C. always speaks for the international community? I've yet to figure out how the Oval Office or the Pentagon is the spokesperson for 8 billion diverse human beings who speak more than 6,000 languages. So, you know, it's, it, I, I could, I could maybe somewhat theorize. I mean, look, human society has changed and also has not changed. I mean, it's a rise and fall of empires and the beginning of an empire is a violent phenomenon. I mean, we've seen it with the Roman, we've seen it, we've read about it with the Roman empire, the Mongol empire, all these ancient empires. And look, even in this day and age, we have empires as well. The United States, Russia, China, you, you, you have Britain, we have all these empires of antiquity in some form or another. There's always an empire controlling everything. Does it claims it speaks for the world? It, it, it has happened. Uh, I recommend uh, Fall of Civilization podcast. If anyone hasn't seen it, uh, I would recommend uh, checking it out because it's uh, it talks about the rise and fall of empires and. Overall, the story is horrifically similar all across the board. An empire rises, brutality, and then it falls like it always happens. And the people are always left uh, picking up the pieces. And what we see is the aftermath and destruction of a lot of communities and people. But with the people of Haiti, the way you've been describing it, because like I, what I want to do for a second interview when, when, when we can schedule it now. But uh, overall, I want to hear about the stories on the ground there about the individuals, because you we, this is like an introduction to who you are, some of your work. But um, what, what I want to do is hear about your interaction with the people building their lives, trying to make a better future, which is what I like to say on my show. Like, hey, let us all do what we can to build a better future. And I want to see if we can schedule that to, to make that happen. So I'll send you an email right away. But as a final note uh, for this, uh, number one, um, what do you want to say to people who might want to do some of the work that you're doing uh, and and get involved in it? Because it obviously takes a lot of time, effort, uh, studying, uh, researching to do this. And then also, where can people follow you online on social media? And are there any kind of projects that you want to plug right now? I know you're back in New York City. So obviously, I want to make sure that everyone knows where they can go. If there's anything online where they can go, uh, take it. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kit. Uh, we want to continue to profile uh, everyday Haitian lives, mm -hmm. uh, who I call the global anonymous heroes, the true heroes. One of the racist uh, stereotypes about Haiti is that there is no honest leadership. Well, that's because whenever there's honest leadership, the empire that you spoke of uh, swoops in and murders and disappears and coups and kidnaps that leadership. Haiti fits the definition of colony. I used to use the word neo-colonialism. The neo with with Gaza, neo just seems redundant when you can annihilate an entire indigenous civilization with pure impunity. The neo, I think, becomes uh, redundant. Um, I'm working on a book that should drop in the next few days, actually, called uh, "We Charge Genocide." Uh, 48 poems for Gaza. The number 48, 1948, when both the UN and Israel uh, become entities that are recognized by the empires of the world, the waning British empire, and of course the burgeoning and US empire. I don't know if US empire has now reached its zenith or if it's in decline. There you have the at prof uh, Danny Shaw. Uh, we, we, you know, we really need support on, on X because they have me delisted so people can't even find me. So if there's any social media uh, experts who know how we can overcome. This is more than a shadow ban. Maybe there's a way to collectively do this if there's any journalists out there. Because the story of Haiti is not being told. So it's very tragic um, mm -hmm. to lose, to lose, you know, millions of people who were following this work because of algorithms and the sophisticated um, uh, mechanisms of censorship that they have. You can follow the Midwestern Marx Institute as well and our popular education initiatives because, because we know CNN and, and Fox News are not going to allow for this robust, honest, integrous conversation about Haiti. Because once you begin to pick apart uh, all of their lies and half-truths and really racist coverage of Haiti, their ideological house of cards begins to crumble. So that's why I think opportunities like this and the alternative media are so important. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's a great note to end it on. Uh, Professor, uh, I'm going to send you an email sometime a little bit later this uh, afternoon, evening, and see if we can get you scheduled to come back on because um, there's now so much that I want to ask even now further. You were saying like there's so much coming into your mind as well. So I definitely want to have you back on. I know uh, I want to give a huge shout out to a good friend of the show, uh, Craig Jardula, who introduced me to you please follow pasta. him on, uh, yeah pasta yo pasta uh, pasta to go his, his his pasta two the number two go uh that's his new youtube channel he's also part of convo couch he's also hosted on the jimmy Dore show so if you haven't followed pasta's work please do so he's doing some great stuff uh nonetheless professor thank you so much for being on our show we will be continuing on with the oh, oh boy, I stuttered there with the rest of our main show uh, after this interview on our YouTube Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, and Kick account. So again, Professor, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. And everyone, please follow him on the social media. When I clip this interview, those links will be in the description box as well as in, pinned in the comment section below. So that way, you could follow the professor and all his good work. So again, thank you so much for being on our show, and we will take a short break after this. Thanks, Kim. No problem. All the best to you guys, everyone, and we'll see you on the main show. Now what to following that idolatry that's just fake? You tolerate that's not fair. The kings of colony watched autonomy make our graves. The kings of colony know no policy, only rave. Now, once you fall asleep, it won't bother you what they say. But the kings of colony, while well, they slaughter, they still complain. And we say, please color me still too solemnly, still too plain. All hail economy, praise the pharmacy, sees in flames. They're buying up Hawaii. And the smoke's not even cleared. Those vultures smelled the fire and an enterprise appeared. Investment opportunities were melted down. Communities leave vacant space. BlackRock has been lusting for for years. The council meets in private and they don't discuss survivors. Concerns among construction groups are all the Haina hears. They'll wander through your city with this mocking sword of pity next to Oprah and her camera crew who tore the trail of tears. Where footage flows as freely as the stream of liquid steel and the pools of pure aluminum that trickled down your wheels and Biden's here to say he knows exactly how it feels cause he had a kitchen fire once and had to miss a meal and people still believe that piece of shit deserves your vote like he's not why supplies are being smuggled in by boat like he's not why our citizens were forced to stay and roast and he can't unfreeze your funding folks cause Azov needs it most I'll bet my every dollar Biden watched it with a smile I'll bet he knows the whereabouts of every missing child he's just the kind of man who lives to trample something tribal collecting cultures corpses just to throw them on the pile like he and all his buddies didn't dream about the day when those who dared defy the donor class were cleared away when home insurance triples and you can't afford to stay and your land falls to the hands of those whose windfall fanned the flames the state will take lahaina and they'll bastardize its name and tourism will swarm it all the same you see the state we left, Lahaina shows the ground rules of the game. The planes that in the night ignite the planes. And if questions raised that reckon the potential use of lasers, I suggest you take a closer shave by way of Occam's razor. And if those civilians stood between this country and its gains, then there's really nothing further to explain. Because you may know this already if you truly know our past but it ain't the first occasion and it will not be the last where americans are kettled in and made to bear the blast are barricaded in and left for ash how many in lahaina now are lying there awake and still can hear the city we left leveled in our wake they still hear all the people that we let the fire take instructed from above to stay in place so look to the horizon because a fire comes for you Desire made incarnate of the power-hungry few Who instructed the police to not let anybody through 
to barricade them in, and so they do.